At the 2024 ACT Expo, there were about 100 clean transportation vehicles on display, including the Oshkosh Next Generation Delivery Vehicle that won the contract from the U.S. Post Office. And the more I learned about that truck, it reminded me of a comedy called The Pentagon Wars. Most people probably haven't seen it. It was loosely based on the development of the Bradley, which started off as a troop carrier with a machine gun on top and ended up looking more like a tank with less room for troops. And I think the same thing may have happened with the U.S. Post Office new vehicle. There was no requirement that said it has to look ugly, but there were lots of smaller, well-meaning requirements that kind of drove it to the way it looks. Let me show you what I mean. What's your problem, Smith? Not elegant enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> It's not like the post office has some legendary history of using great looking trucks. The Jeep DJ series was made for about 30 years. It was functional, but not a great looking Jeep. In 1976, about 350 electric versions were made to test out. The Grumman LLV, that's an acronym for long life vehicle, was based on the Chevrolet S10. It was preceded by the Ford Utilimaster FFV, another acronym for flex fuel vehicle, which arguably has a worse looking front end. That was based on the Ford Explorer and it meets the government requirements to run on 85% ethanol blend. In my area, you still see some in use. Your post office is likely using some Ram Promasters or right-hand drive Mercedes Metris vans today. These vans look normal because the government didn't have time to force changes on them, like adding huge bumper car bumpers. They even have another acronym for this, COTS or commercial off the shelf because the government loves acronyms. Requirements were released for proposal in 2015. Four and a half years later, multiple prototypes were spotted testing head to head. The winning design selected was a proposal from Oshkosh using a heavily modified version of the Ford Transit. But this is where we kind of got catfished because what was revealed in early 2021 was not like the prototype spotted. The question is, how did they get to that? From this. Not that the prototype looked good, but you can kind of cut it some slack because it was trying to use as much of the Ford Transit body as possible. The final design, however, is all new and very awkward, but much of its odd proportions can be explained by the requirements. Looking from the side, the front driver area has a very tall roof. That's because the requirements dictated it be tall enough for a 95th percentile male to be able to stand up without hitting their head. You know, that's not a bad idea. So, all right. So why does the engine compartment look like a duck bill? That's because a fifth percentile female needed to be able to see over the hood to a location safely in front of the van. Again, not a terrible requirement. There were also requirements for step-in height. You know, having gone to a number of these work truck shows, I can tell you how important this requirement is. For example, a cab over truck gives you a great view of the road, but you do not want to have to climb in and out of them multiple times a day. Combined, all these requirements made it challenging to come up with a design that has good proportions. I'm not sure what else they could have done other than this. Nice work, Colonel. Outstanding. Damn impressive. The ink on the contract with Oshkosh hadn't even dried before the questions fired in. Politicians from Wisconsin were delighted with the win until it was announced that production would take place in South Carolina. Some efforts were made to persuade Oshkosh to use the empty Foxconn plant in Wisconsin, but there was no deal. The NRDC and UAW filed a lawsuit 16 states filed a separate lawsuit. This prompted congressional inquiries into how the decision was made. They all alleged wrongdoing, and I warn you before, the government loves acronyms. The EPA, the CEQ, and numerous environmental stakeholders were concerned that the USPA did not meet NEPA obligations with its gas-powered NGDV fleet. So what does all that mean? Well, they wanted to know why the post office decided to make 90% of its advanced new fleet gas-powered when other industrial leaders for last mile delivery were all transitioning to electric. 
the post office eventually filed an updated EIS, that's an acronym for Environmental Impact Statement, and from this we learn some details that are both interesting and confusing at the same time. You know, it should surprise no one that the post office has its own drive cycle test procedure. EPA results just aren't good enough for them, I guess. The gas-powered next-gen does get better fuel economy than the old LLV, and it meets today's emission requirements, but it also has air conditioning, a welcome feature that when turned on just about negates any fuel efficiency improvement. This turned into embarrassing headlines with the data taken out of context. It needs to be said that the off-the-shelf alternatives or COTS like the Ram ProMaster or Mercedes Metris, they don't perform better on this unique test procedure. Two months after the release, the USPS announced a revision to its requirements. Now 75% of the initial order of NGDVs would be battery electric, plus some additional off-the-shelf fans would be purchased, namely the Ford E-Transit. Say, you think you could make this thing amphibious? You know, get the troops across a river? No. Uh, no, sir. No. No, 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 no. The gas-powered NGDV uses a Ford 2-liter turbo engine mated to an 8-speed automatic transmission, driving the front-wheel standard or optional all-wheel drive. The battery electric NGDV has a 94-kilowatt-hour battery. NMC Chemistry, hey, that's an acronym too, not the less expensive LFP Chemistry, which is slowly catching on outside of China. It too will be available in front or all-wheel drive. The required range is 70 miles, with air conditioning or heat on. And more importantly, that's after 10 years of use degrading the battery performance. So in reality, these vans, when they first hit the streets later in 2024, will outperform the 70-mile requirement. The off-the-shelf battery electric, a Ford E-Transit, has a 68-kilowatt-hour battery per the requirements and gets a calculated 77 miles of range but the assumptions are different from the NGDV, so you really can't compare the two. It too should do much better than that. Plus, the new 2024 e-Transit is getting a larger battery for even more range. By the way, if you're interested, I did an overview of Canada Post's new electric van, the C250 powered by Rivian. Charging for the NGDV is complicated. The most common location for charging is in the right front of the van behind a small door. The vehicle on the floor had AC level 2 charging with the J1772 plug. However, at a recent press event, they showed CCS, so it must also DC fast charge. However, that van did not have a door, and the CCS connection seemed to stick out as if it were cobbled together. Perhaps this was a late addition to the requirements. AC being standard, and DC is an option. An option I did confirm is that the charging port can be relocated to the rear of the van for post offices that are configured to have the vans back up to a dock at night. More options are nice, but they do add complexity. All of the charging hardware that's been shown at opening events was AC level two, and that's typical for last mile delivery. If you look at Amazon, Virtually all of the EV charging on site is level two. It's cheap and it gets the job done. But it would be nice to know that the van is capable of DC charging if it needed to. The post office calculated that electric NGDVs will only use 17 to 29% of its battery on a daily basis. Their vehicles just don't drive that far. The longest routes for postal workers are in rural areas where most often, POVs are used. Okay, all right. P POV stands for personally owned vehicles, where they get compensated for using their own car rather than a postal van. That's good work, Smith. Looks perfect to me. Thank you, sir. Thing is... Yes, General? Looks a little like a tank with that cannon on top. Uh, probably gonna draw more fire. Actually, sir, that has come to our attention. The NGDV uses an aluminum unibody construction, not body on frame. A close look at the pictures from the original design and what was displayed at the expo shows some small design changes. For example, the windshield wipers were originally at the top in the pictures, 
but they probably found out that clearing the bottom of the windshield was more important, so that's where they are now. A square patch was added to the front for a radar sensor. The van will have forward collision warning with automatic emergency braking. There are cameras mounted along the top of the van to provide a 360 degree view for the driver. Backup camera too. There's a windshield mounted camera that's in the path of the wipers, so it's obviously for a safety system. I've seen no mention of lane departure warning or pedestrian detection, although maybe those come later. Those are features that rely on a forward facing camera. The post office has said that in the event of an accident, a data recorder in the van will capture information, including video, to document what happened five seconds before and five seconds after the incident, so it could be for that. They also feature front and rear ultrasonic parking sensors, plus blind spot detection sensors go in these locations. The parking brake automatically engages when the van is put into park for added safety. Statistics show that mail carriers are safer exiting and accessing packages from the curbside, so right-hand drive is good. No government contract would be complete without warning labels. Not one, but two for good measure, front and rear. Another adjustment was made to the rear bumper where a small step is going to be added for ease of entry into the rear compartment because in case you didn't read any of the four warning labels, the bumpers can get slippery. As I mentioned before, it has air conditioning, thank God, but since this was originally designed to be a gas engine van first, I didn't see any button for heated seats. Heated seats in a BEV are almost standard because it's much more efficient to heat the driver than to try to heat all the air in the entire van with electrically heated hot air. That seems like an easy thing to add with a change to the requirements. There's only one cup holder and no radio. This holder is actually for a package scanner. That's not for a personal phone. And while we're revising the specs, maybe we can add some more lights in the rear cargo area. I didn't see any, and it was kind of dark back there. What do you think, Colonel? Fine. In summary, is the NGDV a beautiful vehicle? Hell no. Will it do a good job delivering the mail? Dear Lord, I hope so. Will the battery EV version catch on fire? Yeah, eventually it's going to happen somewhere. Gas-powered mail trucks catch on fire, and eventually a battery electric will too. And when it does, you can imagine how the internets are going to react to that. Will there be further design changes? Of course there will. For one, as more LFP battery production comes to America, I would love to see them switch to that chemistry. And finally, how much will it cost compared to a Ford or Ram EV? I don't want to know. Again, thanks for watching this video, and I'll put a link to the scene from the Pentagon Wars right here. Plus, you can watch the whole movie on YouTube. A link to that will be in the notes.